I guess that was the theory. And now I'm here to um, burst the bubble, um, rain on people's parades, um, talk about elephants in the room and other cliches, because I want to talk about the practical side of it. My name's Anna Thompson. I'm Director of Training for LABC, Local Authority Building Control, and that's what we do. So we go around and we see what's actually being built which is good, it's a dirty job, somebody's got to do it. And one of the things that we've been very involved in is talking about the performance gap, because when people first started talking about it, they called it the, the building control performance gap and implied it was our fault, which we thought was unfair because we don't actually build anything. You build them, we look at them for compliance. So we think it might be our fault collaboratively, and uh, we just want to talk about it a lot. So that's why I'm here. Uh, we, we believe that there is a gap, there is a shortfall, there may be a gap in what people think they're getting and what people end up getting, um, which actually, if you, uh, if you want to talk about that bluntly, it's, it's about people telling fibs to people. And we don't think that's right. And people that are commissioning housing don't think that's right. And people that are funding housing don't think that's right. And also, it's not really fair on the people that design things, because they're designing them in good faith. They are then not actually seeing the end product delivered. Um, lots of reasons for that, etc., etc. So that's what we're going to talk about. Does it do what it says on the tin? Uh, we know why, we know about polar bears, we know about penguins and all the rest of it. What people actually care about is their energy prices. Most people don't care about penguins anymore, but they do care about their gas bill. So gas bills, what it means for homeowners, um, particularly tenants, people on low incomes, it's incredibly important. And uh, they don't really care about what it costs to build square metre. They do care about what it costs to heat per month and whether they can have have actual Christmas presents this year. So we, we know all about the figures, we know about energy white papers, etc., etc. And building control gets pretty complacent that every three years part L will change, it will all get tightened up a bit, and we prepare all our presentations and talk about it, and then we read things that say, actually, we're not going to have a new part L next year. And that was a bit of a shock. Was that a bit of a shock? For, I think it was a bit of a shock for most people in government, actually. So uh, certainly was a shock for us. However, when you look at the previous part L's, um, we're not actually achieving them. Now, this is partly because um, you can put your building regs application in now, hopefully, before the 1st of October, to your nearest local authority. And uh, you, you won't have to comply with the new building regs that are coming in. You know, that's, that's, a, that's the way life is. There are things that are starting on site that aren't even being built to the last part L, they're being built to the one before that. But the person buying the brand new house doesn't get told that, do they? They think they're buying a brand new house that meets current standards, and it doesn't. And that's a bit of a fib. So what we have at least got to do is make sure that what people are buying genuinely meets the regulations in place at the time that application was put in. Because otherwise, we don't think it's fair. So part L and zero carbon and the code for sustainable homes, this all sounds a bit defeatist, doesn't it? We're not going to have an uplift in part L. Zero carbon, yeah, not at the moment. The code for sustainable homes, we're not having it anymore. So there are people out there in the real world, going, oh, this is fantastic news. We can build what we like. Nobody's going to make us improve anymore. Nobody's going to make us spend any money per square metre building anything better. Well, that's not true. So what we're trying to do is, is have a bit of a rallying cry to the world out there and say maybe we should use this opportunity to consolidate or whatever you want to call it and actually teach people what they should be building. The problem I have in this session is I'm preaching to the converted because if you, you the, the ones that need to know all this aren't in this room learning about it, are they? They're out there building it cheaply and building it badly, and using unskilled labour, and not investing in training, and not telling anybody how to build it. And that's the problem that building control has, is that we have to try and work with you, the converted, to try and do something about them. Because they 
are our problem. And they're a problem for all of us. So just because you're not one of them doesn't mean that you can't share in the responsibility for doing something about it. Because we have got to close it. We have got to stop fibbing. Does anybody own a Prius? Would you admit that you've bought one? Yeah. Um, I, I don't own a Prius. I do own a Volvo that was supposed to do 50 to the gallon, and it does about 37 if I'm really, really careful. And it annoys me because it was a fib. Have you got a Prius? Does your Prius do what it promised? Really? Yeah, so nothing like what you were promised. And actually, you would have spent your money on a nicer car. Oh! <gasps> No, well, none of us do, do we? But this is the problem. If you bought a price, you probably bought it because you had honourable intentions and you actually wanted to make a difference and it didn't make enough dis difference. Stanford Brook was mentioned. Stanford Brook was exemplary. It was perfect. Would you not think that everybody building, inspecting, specifying on Stanford Brook would have tried really hard to make it work? And yet when they actually looked at what was built and they tested it, it's 66% worse than was promised on a perfect site. So what are the rest of them like? That's a worry, isn't it? I think that's a worry. When I'm doing this talk for builders, I like to make things relevant. I like to talk about beer. If you explain the performance gap to a builder in terms of beer, it works. So... Um, this is, this is what we say. If you've, if you've sold somebody a house and you tell them it will cost you this much beer to heat it in January, and then it actually costs that much beer to heat it in January, that makes February really miserable. That's the kind of level that we've got to get this performance gap stuff down to. We, people don't accept it once they realise. And we've all got a responsibility to sort it out for people. We've got a responsibility to stop people having condensation in their homes. We've got a bit of an embarrassing thing going on with cavity fill at the moment, haven't we? I think we've glossed over that one. But we've, we all know, we all know about build tight, ventilate, ventilate right, but they don't. And, and people are still going to DIY stores and buying felt, uh, f you know, rolls of stuff and, and saying, oh, do you know, I looked in my loft and I had daylight all around the edge. So I filled it all up so you can't see the daylight anymore. Well done. That's going to be a fantastic thing to do for, for condensation in your roof void, isn't it? Because it's all about educating people. Because we laugh because we know why that's stupid. But they don't. They think they're doing the right thing. So the big problem is the performance gap. Is it a building regs compliance gap? Not really, because most people... The building regs is such a low standard that if you're building and you can't even comply with building regs, you really shouldn't be building. You know, what we're talking... That's a terrible thing for me to say, isn't it? But what we're actually talking about is we're trying to get people to build brilliant things, not OK things, which is what level building regs is, but... Out there, they can't build building reg standard. That's why we still have building control. It's for all the people that still can't be bothered to build even to building reg standards. So there is a gap. There is quite a big gap. It's a performance gap. It's a compliance gap in some cases. But we have people who are absolutely building to building reg standard, but they're still not building what was promised to the person that's buying the house. Why is it happening? Where is the incentive out there for people to build things properly? They get paid, don't they, whether they build them properly or not, in some cases. Obviously not in your case, because your sites are run properly. Do you know what we get told when we do this for builders? I don't like to say anything, because do you know how hard it is to get a bricklayer? What, so you're paying people to build things that you know are wrong because you're scared they might not turn up tomorrow? That's awful. Is it true? Isn't it awful? Shouldn't we be doing something about it? So the gap exists in housing, but it also exists in commercial buildings. It exists in anything that gets built um, by the wrong kind of people. So the solutions have to apply to everything. Um, we're getting much better at explaining things. We're just talking about unexpected heat loss. We all know that there will be some heat loss. We're talking about the unexpected, unplanned heat loss that isn't mentioned in the SAP calc. 
You know, I mean, some of the things in SAP are quite funny. Like, you do have to list how drawn the curtains will be and what colour they are, which always makes me laugh, because who thinks anybody in the world has got control over that? You don't have to have any curtains, do you? You get signed off for building regs without any curtains. Oh, but it said in SAP. You know, so... How are we putting action plans in place? Do any of you actually have any kind of performance gap action plan in place? I know some of you do. Are any of you maybe prepared to share it? Is that the kind of thing we could do to get this better? Actually share it with people, what we're doing? How are we getting technical details right? Are we explaining to people on site what technical details mean? Are we explaining why continuous importance is uh, continuous insulation is important. I will share something with you. I started in building control 30 years ago tomorrow. That's a long time. 30 years ago tomorrow. When we were doing building control 30 years ago, if we went on site and there was some insulation, we went, yeah, fantastic, big tick, insulation. Okay, but those people are still building things. Actually, they're still specifying things. And they haven't moved on, and they still think some insulation is a right result. It's not, is it? Um, so the common practice and the things that are going wrong are just going wrong all over the place. It tells you in the approved document, oh, yeah, but an approved document's only guidance, isn't it? What, so that means you don't have to have continuous insulation? That, this picture here, 30 years ago, that would have been outstanding because it's almost all full of insulation, so 30 years ago, we didn't understand that actually doing most of it really well but having a little gap actually creates a far worse problem in the building than if the whole lot is a bit rubbish. So we're, we're now saying to people, you need to blue line your drawing. What? How many of you blue line drawings or work off blue line drawings? Not enough. We're going to talk about that then. So air tightness. Air How many, do you know where you buy air tightness tape? Do you? Because I did a series of, of these. We did 25 talks for builders, ordinary builders, in, and we ran them all in a, in a well-known builders merchant, and I'm not going to tell you which one. Um, before I started each session, I went down to the counter and I said, have you got a roll of air tight tape so I can show them the difference between that and duct tape? No. What, because you've run out because you've sold so much this week? No, we don't stock it. Seriously, I'm doing a talk about air tightness and you don't stock air tightness tape. Now, I think you shouldn't be allowed to buy an insulation board unless you buy a roll of tape with it. That's quite sensible, isn't it? Okay, you cannot buy... In our two biggest national builders merchants, you can't buy air tightness tape off the shelf. That is a disgrace. What are we doing about that? Did you, did you know that? Are you prepared to do something about that? Because I think that is a disgrace. And I think we should be doing something about it. They'll probably have started stocking it last week, so I'm now lying to you, but I don't think so. So air tightness, tape, etc., etc. We can show people pictures. Does it make any difference? Did it make any difference to Stanford Brook? No, it didn't. Stanford Brook, they knew they were being examined, they knew everything had to be perfect, and they still had unacceptable heat loss around, around predictable things, like holes where light fittings go. Why didn't they predict that? Why didn't they sort out the quality control? We've, we've talked about thermal bridging, I'm not going to go into that, but we know that Lintels is one of the, uh, the favourite places for it. Thermal bypass, we didn't have that 30 years ago. We had a bypass around Watford, but that was about it. Thermal bypass is, is, a, is a new phenomenon. So people coming out of college that know about SAP know about thermal bypass, but people that have been building stuff for 30 years don't. But they might carry on building it for another 10 years or more. So we're going to have to sort them out and explain what it means. Um, we're going to have to show them pictures. Now, I have, a, I have a theory I'd like to share with you. I believe everybody that goes on any building site in any kind of supervisory capacity should have the app on your iPhone, which is a fake thermal image camera. Did you know you can get one? There is a fake thermal image app. So you hold your phone up. I meant to have my phone up here with it on. And it, it, you can waft it around, and it comes up with what might vaguely look like a thermal image of that wall. Obviously, it's not. 
do you not think if we actually all kept that a secret and and started using that and going, oh, I'm just going to check this wall you, that you've built that you've just told me is exactly as it said on the specification. Hold on a sec, I'll just open my app. Do you think they'd let you? I think that is the way forward. I think that is a brilliant idea. Um, I think it might be immoral, but hello. Okay. Hmm. Talk to me about that. That's that's fantastic. I won't charge you for the idea, even though it's you know. So I think thermal image is brilliant because it's scary. It's like it's like breath detectors for are you over the drink drive limit, isn't it? Because the policeman will look at you and ask you if you've had a drink, and you can say exactly what you like. Like we know that we can get tested for it, don't we? If we knew that our walls were going to get tested, I think it's the way forward. So windows and doors, ceiling, 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 but we've got to push for getting these airtight tapes and products actually to become in everybody's van, in everybody's you know, workroom, wherever they are. Ventilation, I'm not going to talk about ventilation to the nth degree because I'm here to talk about performance gap, but it would be good if we um, thought about ventilation more and realised that we should provide some because otherwise people are going to start dying. Um, Sequencing process. Hopefully, most of you who are building decent stuff are already talking about sequencing and getting the process right and things like that, so I really don't need to tell you. But you do need to be planning it, talking about it, doing it, checking it, and testing it. Because otherwise, it's just a theory. It's just a nice idea. Uncontrolled design changes. They are such a massive problem still, aren't they? I have a friend, he's a developer. He builds about three nice things a year. He sells them for about a million quid each. They're very nice. They're all kind of white with big windows and, and they're lovely houses. And he builds them out of block work because it's the cheapest thing you can build out of. Gets a sap done because the building inspector makes him. He doesn't give a rat about any of this. He does what he has to do so he can build this great house, a nice quality, because he, he can't stand going back and putting things right that have gone wrong. So the quality, in some respects, is awesome. But uncontrolled design changes? Oh, I know, I found a brilliant bargain. I got this stuff from Poland off eBay. It's amazing. I said, is it what, what it said it would be in your sap? Don't be daft. But it's a bargain. You should see it. I'm building three houses. Do you know how much money I'm saving? I'm buying a new Jag. You know, and it's, unfortunately, that does happen, doesn't it? Because it's all about how much is it to build a square metre? Look what I saved by using this terrible product. And that's the problem. They want to save money by using the terrible product. You wouldn't dream of it. So alternative products are a problem, and building control have to spend a lot of time on site looking for packaging so that we can actually decide what they have used and not what they said they were going to use, which is tricky. Training. We are, we've just started a project with the Federation of Master Builders. We're going to be providing toolkit training, toolbox training rather, um, training all over the country for FMB members to go to just to start learning the basics. Um, is everybody doing that for their own staff, for their own people, for the people that they're employing and paying to do a good job? I hope so, but if you're not and you need some help with it, please talk to me because my, my life is training. So uh, I like talking about it. Site culture. Have we got a good site culture? Is it cool on site to build brilliantly? No, it isn't. Should it be? Of course it should be. You know, I think the site culture is a difficult thing. It's not something building control can get involved in, apart from the fact that we have now started going on site and going, oh my God, this is brilliant. This is such a good job. We'd like to put this up for a building excellence award. Can you imagine like 20, 25 years ago, building control saying, we want to give you an award for building. We, building control didn't used to be like that, did it? You know, it was, we're going to give you a slap, but it wasn't an award. Um, and now we're actually trying to get people excited about the concept of doing a good job. 
because we think that might actually help. So I don't know if any of you have ever won, of our, won one of our Building Excellence Awards, but I like to think you either have or you will do. And, um, and it's great because it makes people proud, proud, proud of what they have built and what they have done that day at work. And that's what we need to do. Detailed drawings. Um, personally, building control, our view is we don't actually like building notices because you don't need a drawing at all. So how is anybody supposed to know what they build? But the government says you can use a building notice. Who are we to argue with it? If you are the specifier, presumably you hate building notices. Um, but you can still have a building notice with a decent specification, with details, with registered construction details. And that is why we think some of the thing we're doing, like the builder's book, is really helping because you've actually got something you can tear out, pin on the wall and build, which is a good thing. It will tell them about things like junctions. It will introduce the concept of blue lining. What, it doesn't take you two minutes to explain to somebody that a blue line is the, is the line between the inside of the building and the outside of the building and there mustn't be any breaks in it. That's kind of what a blue line is on a drawing, isn't it? But, but, but people don't explain it to people, and they don't start using them. So people haven't started looking for a blue line on a drawing. Because people don't have drawings pinned up anymore, do they? Because it's all, it's all CAD and BIM. What about real building sites where they still have a site hut with a kettle in it? Maybe sometimes they still need a drawing or a registered construction detail with a blue line on it. Because actually, that's how real people think. I do wish, in some respects, everything was built off-site in a nice, clean factory, but it isn't. So we have got to still work with the rest of it. Performance testing. We do lots of testing now, don't we? We're, thermal imaging is a good thing. We're doing building performance evaluations. I think all of this is a good thing um, because we've got to start building out some of these horrendous defects. So I hope that we are getting towards the point where we will have clear plans for everything with detailed drawings, et cetera, et cetera. But the skills and the knowledge is, is really critical. What are we doing? What's building control in local authorities trying to do about this? Um, we've started, we actually believe that, that one of the key roles, how strange though it may seem, about a building control surveyor is that we should go on site and do inspections. So we do know that you can buy very, very cost-effective building control if cost is your thing. Do you want your building control by somebody taking a photograph of it and going, that looks okay? Or would you like the building control surveyor to explain to the person that's put that insulation in badly why that isn't the right way to do it? Because we think that actually being on site and explaining things is a massive part of our job. It's that education role. And we think that that's where you get what you pay for. So we've introduced the inspection service plans that we talk about with you. We talk about what you actually want on your site. We talk about how we can deliver that for you. We talk about what it will cost. And hopefully we get a better job at the end of it. We have a partnership scheme. I don't know if any of you are signed up for it, but it means you can work with a building control team that you actually like and you can talk to and you can deal with. And you can work with them everywhere in the country. It, just, it, it works for a lot of people because most things are about relationships, aren't they? And they're about actually being able to phone somebody up and going, I've got a terrible problem, can you help me? That's difficult when you keep doing that with new people, isn't it? If you can work with somebody consistently, that is a nicer way to do it. Registered details, I think we talked about that already. Um, there are the government registered details, there are LABC registered details. We used to do things called type approval. Uh, we still do type approval, but we call it registered details. I know some of you are using it. I know one of you is having a problem with it, which I hope we can help sort out. Um, it just basically means you get a rubber stamp on your design, on your product, that you can then take around the country and go, I've got an LABC rubber stamp on this. That's fine. Build that. Lovely. Thank you very much. So ultimately, it does save you time, and it will help you get through your warranty approval quicker, providing we've got it sorted with warranty initially before the work starts. So it's, it is useful. Our registered construction details, um, at the moment, they are for masonry. We've compiled them with the Modern Masonry Alliance, et cetera, et cetera. They are proving a massive hit. We're now working with the Timber Frame Association. That will be the next phase that we will have registered construction details for Timber Frame as well. They are free. Because the acoustic registered details, you have to pay for, don't you? 
which we are a little uneasy with, because we think if you want somebody to do something, you should make it freely available to them, like the approved documents are free. So we've made our registered construction details free because we want people to use them. So have a look if you haven't already. Um, they are designed, they have like a shopping list, an idiot's guide list, and a picture. They're pretty easy to use. Um, they're not highfalutin. They look like that. Um, you know, if you do want a simplified version, I'm sure we can help, but I really don't think anybody will need them any more simple than they are um, as existing. So do please have a look at those if you haven't already. We do think we're going to actually build better homes through people using them. So there you are. You've got your build-up list, you've got your points to watch, and you've got a picture if you don't like reading. So I don't think there's any excuse if you use those. And they cover all the construction details for masonry that you can possibly think of. If there are any missing, let us know, and we'll work on it with you. So you can, you can get all those. I'm not sure if people are getting the slides at the end of these with phone numbers and things on, but I've got some cards with email addresses and what have you on. We have things like a builder bulletin. We really are aiming at the people doing the work. So we produce a builder bulletin every now and again. It has a one paragraph, one liner about what's changed in the building regs, what's changed in products, what's changed in code for sustainable homes. And then you can go and read something more highfalutin if that's what you want. But if you don't and you're a builder and you're reading this on your phone while you have a cup of tea one morning, that's how we've written it. That's what it's aimed at. If you would like your company signed up for this, talk to me about it. The builder's book, I think, is stupendous. I think the builder's book is, it, it is going to be a game changer. I think it really is that good um, as long as people use it. We're all working together on it. Everybody has forgotten their old battles and all the rest of it. And we are actually, everybody involved in it genuinely believes that it will help make a difference. Um, our warranty company believe in it because they are trying to make it easier to get structural warranties, warranties on housing, warranties on commercial buildings. Um, because we think it gives the end user a bit more comfort. I still think the end user would have a bit more comfort if their gas bill was lower. But, you, you know, you know about that. You've heard that. So that's what we do. That's what building control is trying to do about the performance gap, about helping you to build things that people want to live in. Um, thank you very much. I did a lot of training around air tightness after 2002. And for several years, I could say I'd done more training for building control than the government had. And my, I guess my question is, where are your resources? Because it's great if building control does its job and is able to do its job, but my experience out there is they're not. Are you talking about local authorities or building control in general? Uh, both, but I mean, approved inspectors if you wanted to you know, improve energy efficiency, abolish approved inspectors would be a good start. <sighs> I've just fallen in love. Um, I couldn't possibly comment on that idea. Um, we, are, we are doing something about it. We have just, um, in the last couple of years, spent 90,000 on bursaries, which, 90,000, which, given that we're kind of funded by by local government is actually quite a lot of money for us, £90,000. And we're giving it to councils to spend on college fees. We're running boot camps for building control students, rookies, to come in and, and learn about building control. I'd quite like to get some house builders to come and talk to our boot camp about what it's like being a house builder, um, because I think that would be good for them to hear. We take them to BRE, we take them to the innovation park, we put them in smoke containers at fire stations and set fire to them to show them why travel distances matter and things like that. So um, we are doing quite a lot to bring in new resources. Um, in doing that, you then have to obviously train them on the job. They need to learn from, from the older ones. They need to get taken out and shown around, um, which is also then good for the older ones because they have to go and read all the rules and find out all the new stuff because they might get caught out by the newbie. So... Um, I don't know. I think we're doing quite a lot. We could always do more, but we're doing, we're doing more than we were. <laughs>